Andrew Deacon is a doctor in Cairo in South Georgia who went to federal prison almost 20 years ago for writing illegal prescriptions to women patients in exchange for sex or allowing him to take nude photos of them. After he got out of prison, he reapplied for his license in Georgia with the Georgia Composite Medical Board and they reissued it. In this installment of our series on doctors and sex abuse, we focus on the various state laws that govern licensing of physicians across the country and how they affect uh, sexual misconduct cases. What we found that there are only six states that have a bright line prohibiting physicians who engage in felony sexual misconduct to be prohibited from practicing. Georgia, like most states, has no such law and these decisions are all left to the discretion of the medical board. Chris Dorsey is a GBI agent who lives in Cairo. It's a little town in South Georgia, not far from the Florida line, and it's the county seat of Grady County. He was tipped that Dr. Deacon was writing illegal prescriptions in exchange for sex or taking sexually explicit photos of female patients. He served a warrant at an office Dr. Deacon maintained at the time in Thomasville. And in a cabinet in that office, he found between 400 and 450 sexually explicit photos of between 16 and 17 women, most of them patients. And ultimately, three of them testified for the government at Dr. Deacon's trial. One of those women was Cindy Sheridan. She then was using her married name, Cindy Beasley. And she very vividly described for the jury what occurred. This is a journal that I had written in 1990. Mm. And one of the things that I wrote, my birthday is November and I'll be 36. I wish it was not a sin to commit suicide. It would be the best present, birthday present ever. I love my children, how do I survive? I was in a very abusive marriage, very. And I went to Dr. Deagle for something for my nerves. And he gave me a prescription of Xanax and he gave me his cell number and told me if I needed him, call him. Well, I knew, you know, in a way, you know, what was, he was really saying. But I was so desperate, so desperate. I don't wish that on anyone to feel the way I felt. And to be abused by a husband and then turn around and be abused by my doctor, you know, it was a double whammy. So this was like in a five year period, four to five year period. So um, I would try so hard to detox at home so I wouldn't have to go to him. But I always ended up going back because I was addicted to pain pills and Xanax. I took 50 Xanax thinking that that would do it. That would, you know, kill me. Unfortunately, I didn't know that it wouldn't. <laughs> I woke up in the hospital. I was very angry, very angry because I didn't die. The only thing I knew in my head that to get away from this, to get away from Deacle, I had to move. The GBI called me, Mr. Dorsey called me and said, do you know that between 1989 and 1991 that you were prescribed enough pills to kill 200 people? And I said, you need to talk to my lawyer. And the GBI talked to my lawyer, and they gave me what's called a sweetheart deal if I testified against him. Um, and I would have done it anyway. It wouldn't have mattered if they had charged me. I would have told the truth, you know? Um, a lot of the girls, unfortunately, that were involved still has to live in Cairo. And I'm lucky, I'm very lucky that I'm not in Cairo.
Patty Dozier, formerly Patty Ward, is a reporter at the Thomasville Times Enterprise, and she covered Dr. Diekel's trial on a daily basis. And she's someone who can tell you about the emotion of those days. I sat here, I, I sat right here, maybe not right in this corner, but there or there, but I sat on this pew every day. And being a crime reporter as I am in courts, I thought I had heard and seen it all. But I was personally very embarrassed by the testimony. And I distinctly remember during a lot of it, visibly blush, blushing, I could feel myself blushing. The trial was or is a highlight in my newspaper career, but not because it was a great trial or anything like that. Everything about it has stayed with me. Dr. Diekel was allowed to practice again in 2003. And you talk to people there, and they say he does a lot of good things. Kim Johnson has been a patient of Dr. Diekel's for almost 20 years, and she's also worked in his office while doing training as a nurse. He is everything that I want to be when I become a practitioner. He is kind and caring, and it's not about quantity. It's about the quality of care that he gives to his patients. It's about being part of this community and taking care of everybody. And Dr. Dickel will be honest and he'll say, um, I did stupid stuff and I got in trouble and you know, that's how we learn. He didn't go out there looking for it. It came to him. Yes, that's where he crossed the line and he was wrong, but he paid his price. He paid for his crimes and he has proven to everyone in the community, to everyone here that He's here for good, that he does good, that he is a good man, and isn't that the Christian thing to do is to forgive and forget and move on? But there are also people who know the past, who know what he did, who frankly see the faces of these women who at the time had these horrible drug addiction problems and what they went through. I really don't understand the support. I didn't understand it at the trial. It never occurred to me that his license would be restored. It makes me angry. But I was a victim for a long time. And I'm a survivor. And it feels great because he's not hanging over my head. I'm not renting any space in my head for 